today we're going to uh, so today we're going to um, talk a little bit about you know some uh, mature prairie strips so talking about what to expect kind of down the road once you've planted them um, four or five up, you know up through the entire contract length at 10 years and a lot of these uh, prey strips have 30-year uh, contracts at least I don't know about a lot but that's an option so you know thinking about what uh, what to expect as these uh, prey strips change over time and uh, kind of fall into their uh, more mature um, state. so uh, today we want to talk um, about continuing to build our skills using site context uh, for, for plant ID and of course talking about site age. And uh, we'll be focusing on familiarizing ourselves with um, plants that we often encounter in uh, four or older, uh, four year older strips. And then um, once we talk through that, uh, Laura Jackson um, will be talking through um, some tips to be able to identify some of the most important prairie grasses and prairie strip grasses vegetatively, because um, as you learn this right now in July is a great time to look at uh, wildflowers, but the grasses won't be um, blooming um, for quite a bit yet. So, um, so that's a very helpful skill set to have, and, and uh, Laura will be covering that. Okay, so uh, next week. We'll be talking about seedling ID. Um, we'll be introducing a new um, resource, um, seedling ID guide, um, and we'll talk about stand assessment. But we also wanted to leave this lecture open to you um, to make sure that um, you know you've you've gone through the first uh, four lectures here, and um, you know what has come up in your minds, or have we covered the topics that you want to cover with respect to prey strips and plant ID. Um, if we haven't covered something, let us know in the chat. What would you like to have us cover next week? So um, we want to make sure that uh, we address the topics that you you all want to, uh, to learn about. So um, add those in the chat, or you can also send me, uh, Andy, Laura, or Ann an email. Um, talking about what you would like to see next week. Um, I've got uh, at least one suggestion, but um, from uh, earlier in the uh, east season here, but uh, we'd love to hear some more suggestions from you. So I'm um, looking forward to looking over those and um, incorporating that into our next lecture. Okay. So today we're going to be covering um, a pretty wide variety of plants. Um, so I will be covering the first four, and then Laura Jackson will cover the last four. Um, these are all extremely uh, characteristic plants of tall grass prairies and of most uh, tall grass prairie plantings as well, including prairie strips. So, so these are going to be kind of classics and um, things that you will definitely uh, encounter in the field, especially in some of the older plantings. Okay, so we talked about CRP age as a plant ID guide last week, talking about how, especially in those first three years, um, the vegetation changes really dramatically from year to year. But once we hit, you know, about year four, things sort of start to uh, change more slowly and um, you kind of get a, a more um, stable plant eco or stable plant community. So today we're going to be talking about those uh, year four plus plantings where we encounter mostly long lived plants. And so that's generally what we'll be talking about today. Um, so, you know, we talk about long-lived plants dominating the, these stands. Um, and the, by and large, the year-to-year -year variation that we're seeing um, 
that's giving the differences in flowering and the warm season grasses are becoming more prominent as they're more or less at their full size at this point. Um, shorter lived plants most certainly still exist within these plantings, but you know, for example, wild rye, black eyed Susan, but they're becoming a lot less common and they'll become even less common over time. Um, and we also tend to see fewer wildflowers in absolute terms. So the actual number of blooms out there uh, is probably decreasing um, compared to the first two years, but we do have more variety in the blooms. So we have a, a more diversity with respect to the kinds of species that are blooming. Um, and we'll talk about some of those things that you're likely to find. Okay, so um, so this here, is, this photograph is a four-year-old prairie strip. Um, and we'll talk through some of these key plants. You know, we've already seen quite a few of them. Oxi, that is a plant that sticks around. We talked about that, even in mature plantings. Yellow coneflower also is going to be with us throughout the entire prairie strip life cycle. Um, sawtooth sunflower, that one we won't cover today, but generally speaking, sunflowers become more common as a uh, as they grow, their vegetative, um, vegetative, uh, their, their vegetative growth, their rhizomatous nature tends to mean that they increase in size over time, so they become more common. Um, and here's a picture of big blue stem that's beginning to be particularly um, prominent part of the plant community. Okay, so let's. Uh, look at this other planting. We're going to do our first plant of the day. So this is an even older planting. This is a six-year-old planting. Um, this uh, I took this picture two weeks ago, I think, or, or last week, I forget, but um, recently. So it's from a planting in the fall of 2016. So, um, so we're looking at the six-year-old planting. Um, what we see is really, a, a, like, like I was talking about earlier, a really high diversity of, of stuff. So, you know, we see a lot of variation in the kinds of wildflowers. The grasses at this point are not quite uh, growing as uh, tall as um, they would be a little later, so they're not as uh, prominent. But um, diversity, differences in the kinds of flowers are really key here. So we're gonna focus in on this plant that's kind of right next to us. This plant right here, uh, we can also see that it uh, shows up throughout this planting. You know, there's a kind of a patch right here and um, also over here. So it's, it's a pretty common plant in this prairie strip. So we wanna figure out what is that. We're going to use Newcombs, so we're going to want to figure out what's our flower type, plant type, leaf type. So taking a look here, we don't really have any symmetry, right? So um, a bilateral symmetry like most flowers do, um, but we don't have any radial symmetry. So these are irregular flowers in these clusters. alternate leave, uh, leaf arrangement on a wildflower. And we have divided leaves, pinnate divided leaves, if you recall from our previous lectures. Um, and it has quite a few leaflets. So uh, this one in particular has about 30 leaflets um, and they're elliptic to oblong um, in shape. So that'll become important a little later. But let's use these characteristics to run through our. Um, so we put all this together. That gives us our group number of 134. And if we take that um, through those keys, that gives us page number 66. And 
once we get on the page 66, we have a couple options for us, but um, it's a pretty straightforward um, thing to look at. We can look basically at the, uh, the or color. So these flowers are cream colored, um, kind of yellowish maybe. And so that's going to get us to Canadian milk vetch. So that is our first plan of the day, Canada milk vetch uh, or Stragulus canadensis. Now, um, actually, let me go back to here. Sorry. So um, talk a little bit about Stragulus canadensis before we talk about some of uh, a key look like weed. Um, so Canadian milk vetch, um, other names, Canada milk vetch or just regular milk vetch. It's sometimes called that. Um, really sh uh, on the shorter side of things, about three feet tall. Um, and uh, it is a rhizomatous plant um, and it's also perennial. So, you know, if we remember from that photograph that we looked at when we first saw it, we notice it kind of was growing in these patches. So that is generally a, a good indication that it's a, a rhizomatous plant. Uh, it's in the legume family, so, uh, or a pea family. So it's a nitrogen fixing plant. Um, now is kind of its peak time to be flowering, June to August in Iowa. Definitely, uh, uh, typically doesn't really bloom too, too much past uh, July. So. Now's a great time to be out there looking at it. So let me up and talk about um, an important distinction um, in this plant compared to another one that looks very similar, um, and that is crown vetch. So um, crown vetch is a invasive species. You know, we talk sometimes about weeds, annual weeds, uh, biennial. Uh, this is, you know, we want to make a distinction between a weed, which is a basically a plant that we don't want in a place, and an invasive species, which has a specific meaning that it displaces native plants and causes harm to ecosystems. So ground vetch is definitely one of those invasive plants. Um, it is perennial. It actually has a lot of the same traits as Canada milk vetch. It's a perennial plant. It's highly rhizominous and we'll take a look at what that can you know result in um and it's a really prolific seed producer so all those things combined means it's a very uh, very tenacious invasive species in my experience i haven't seen it too often in agricultural contexts um but definitely it was widely planted along roadsides um in the past and I think in some places it still is. Um, and uh, that's typically where this species, uh, this crown vetch will begin its uh, invasion into uh, habitats, which could include prey strips if they're next to a road. So this is one to keep an eye out for. Um, so how do we tell the difference between Canada milk vetch, which is a great, great plant that we want um, in our prairie strips versus crown vetch, which is something we would want to treat as soon as we see it. Um, you know, take, take note of it and come up with a, a management plan for it. So the easiest uh, way, especially if we're looking at this plant now, if we're going out now and doing assessments, is the flower color. So like we talked earlier, um, Stragulus canadensis has cream flowers, cream to yellow flowers, which is in contrast to crown vetch, which has pink flowers, pink to white. So that's a very easy way to tell them apart. But if we're going out later in the season or earlier in the season, um, rely on leaf characteristics. So how can we tell them apart vegetatively? They're a little tricky to tell apart uh, vegetatively, but you can do it with some practice. Um, Canada milk vetch has more leaflets in their divided leaves. So typically it's in the high 20s and low 30s for leaflets. 
And those leaflets tend to be shaped more elliptically, more um, less oblong. So basically they are, oops, um, when we talk about oblong, uh, that what we're generally talking about would be parallel and um, sort of similar um, kind of um, arcs, uh, arc lengths that go down to the, uh, whereas, uh, so that's a traditional oblong leaf, but with our astragalus canadensis, we have more of this elliptical uh, look to it. So, so that is our um, one way, that's a fairly subtle way to tell them apart, um, but that's Canada milk veg. So if we look at crown veg, like we're saying, this is a very classic um, oblong shape. I have these parallel sides that go straight. And then we have a fairly kind of a peanut looking, I guess, uh, or cylindrical tic-tac shape um, leaflet. So we don't really have that um, elliptical uh, Again, fewer leaflets, they can overlap, but um, with some practice, it's, it's, uh, it's something to them apart. Uh, okay, so crown vetch, again, if you see it, um, often you'll realize that it's definitely not uh, Canada milk vetch because it's in these really, really dense monoculture mats. Um, these are produced combination of rhizomes and extremely high seed production. And this is why we want to try to avoid having this plant in a prairie strip, uh, mostly because it is a, a potential for um, causing a lot of uh, damage to our you know, plant community. So crown vetch um, coming up with these, uh, these really dense mats in a, in a worst case scenario. Okay. So we're gonna move on to our next plant of the day. So this is another um, fairly uh, old planting. This is a six-year-old planting. And we're going to uh, take a look here at this very unique plant. It doesn't look like anything we've seen so far. So let's take a look. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at the flowers, plant, and the leaf type. So these are indistinguishable. Uh, they really don't have any clear flowering parts that we can see at this point. Um, we have alternate leaves and we have toothed, long, narrow leaves. That's going to get us to group number 833, and we run this down. We've got leaves that are more than two times long as they are wide, and they're also toothed. That's going to help us get to page 418. So we get to 418, we have a couple options. Um, of course, the clearest uh, differentiation is this sort of button-like flowering structure in the heads. Um, and it looks like a yucca, right? So this is, and if you look, this is sort of looks like a desert plant. It's very unique. The vegetation is unlike anything else uh, this far east, typically. So if we look through our uh, options, that's going to get us to Rattlesnake Master, Laryngium yuccafolium. So that is our second plant of the day. Um, has a couple other common names, um, kind of strange names that uh, um, certainly people who are prairie people often don't encounter these names. Oringo is more of a, a lot more species of this farther west, but um, so other common names are all snake master, or button snake root Oringo. Button snake root, just button a ringo. 
Uh, at least in Iowa, those are not very commonly used, but sometimes if you're buying seed from somewhere that's not necessarily um, from around here, something to take a look at. Um, Plants fairly um, run of the mill as far as height. It's not tall, not short. Um, it can get up to about five feet tall, but often it's closer around three feet. And this is a tap-rooted perennial plant. So um, it's not rhizomatous. You'll see it only uh, as individuals that are established from seed. So um, large clones of this plant, like you would with some of the other ones. Um, and now is a good time to go check it out. It's just beginning its flowering season. So it'll be flowering through August for us. And again, this one is, um, it's included in a lot of seed mixes. It's definitely one that doesn't show up immediately. Um, and so it's quite characteristic of a mature prairie strip. Um, once it does show up, you know it's there. It's so unique. This is a plant that is, is a great one for beginners because it's, you know, when we talk, when we think about how do you start with botany, it's about sort of recognizing patterns and differences in vegetation. And this has such a unique pattern of its leaves, such a unique pattern of its um, flowers that it's um, it's very easy to remember and um, it's something that sticks in people's minds. Um, the name Rattlesnake Master, I've always been told it was uh, used as a, it was thought of as a potential, um, you know, treatment for, for snake bites, but as, a, as is all of these common names, it's never, <laughs> It's never really a, uh, uh, where is the, uh, where these names come from. So interesting uh, trivia there. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our second or our third plant of the day. Uh, this here is a, a photograph of some mature prairie um, and we're looking at this pink flower. What could we have here? Okay, so let's take a closer look, really close look, flowers, plant type, and leaf type. So we have irregular flowers that are about a half inch um, in size, alternate leaves, the uh, wildflower, and we have divided leaves. So that's going to take us to group 34. Okay, so to get to that page, um, we need to do a little more uh, work with that key. So we have three leaflets. Flowers are pink, they're not yellow. These leaflets, especially the, or the, the middle leaflet here has a pretty prominent stock. Um, and we have entire uh, leaf margins. Takes us to page 62. Okay, so once we get to page 62, there's still have a good amount of work to do. Um, so we have to work through to get to our species. So um, do we have, so let's take the first uh, number one, do we have a narrow terminal leaflet? Not really wide and it's not any narrower than the other um, leaflets. So let's go to number two. Are they round? Is this sort of trailing? Definitely not. Definitely not round. Definitely not trailing species. So let's go to number three. Um, our flowers, if you remember our first photograph, they are in close clusters and they are about half of an inch long. So that lets us know that we have showy tick tree fly, Desmodium canadens on our hands. So, um, so that's our third plant of the day. Uh, other names for this species are Canadian tick clover, uh, just Canada tick tree flower. This is a taller plant. Um, it can get uh, up to six feet tall, and that's fairly typical. Uh, and this one again is a tap-rooted perennial, so you won't find uh, big clusters or clones of this either. 
Um, and now is more or less it's beginning to flower. So now's a good time to go check it out. Maybe wait a little bit longer to go uh, looking for this plant. But uh, probably the most unique thing about this plant, you wouldn't encounter this until it sets seed, um, usually in you know, late September, early October. Um, it has very sticky seeds. So it's that is its um, means of seed dispersal is sticking to anything that comes through the prairie, especially if you have clothes or fur, it sticks right to anything like that. So um, if you have a prairie strip that's full of this stuff and you walk through it, you'll know <laughs> if you walk through in uh, the end of September or early October, because you'll have these uh, seed pods all stuck to your clothes. So now's a good time to do a botany break. So maybe we'll take a question or two uh, before moving on to our to my last segment. Oh. Yeah, we had uh, one question about the field day. I put the RSVP form in the chat. Yep, you're still good to join us there. We're welcome. Uh, this picture, this not picture. Oh my goodness, this question from Susan. Uh, how accurate are plant ID apps like picture this? Yeah, so that I think that would be, was that a suggestion to um, cover in the next lecture? I think it's a good suggestion uh, if it, I don't know. I'm not sure if there's delineation, but. That, that's, uh, I've gotten other um, interest in that as well, so. We'll definitely take that under consideration for um, looking at that next week. Any other questions for um, the stuff we covered today? If not, we'll uh, keep moving along here to our last plant of the day. Um, so this is a seven-year-old planting, even older. Um, and what we begin to see here is, um, so this one's got quite a bit more grass in it, but also we have some fairly unique looking plants. So this, uh, this pink plant looks interesting. So um, there's also some more of it, um, Here. So it's uh, something that uh, definitely part of our plant community. So let's see if we can figure that one out. Okay, here's our flower type. Take a look at the plant type and our leaf type. Okay, so we have seven parts. We'll use Nucum, see if we can get it. Um, seven parts here. Got alternate leaves, of course, a wildflower. And we our leaf margins, simple leaves. Okay. So let's see if we can find this group number. Okay, so we have more than seven parts. Um, alternate leaves. Uh, do not have yellow flowers. So we do have entire leaves. Um, and so we do uh, have not yellow flowers. So that gives us uh, page numbers 368. Okay. So let's take a look at page 368. This is a uh, not looking very promising, right? So we we do not have daisy or aster-like flowers, really. I mean, we technically do, but we don't have that daisy look or the symphytricum or aster look to them. Um, so don't look like any other pictures. So I don't think we're going to get this one with Newcomb. So what? What are we going to do? 
So this is a good opportunity to, um, to look at some other options that we have. So let's take a look at some online resources for this plant. take a look at uh, Soda Wildflowers. And minnesotawildflowers.info, um, see the source there on the screen. Um, you have to, you know, donating is a great idea. These guys have an exceptional website. I strongly recommend anybody uh, use this site because it is a truly amazing resource. Here's the homepage for Minnesota wildflowers. All right, so we already did quite a bit of work looking at this plant, taking note of a lot of the different um, characteristics of it. So we can very easily use that information to, in, in, a, in a way, um, basically kind of work through um, a key-like approach on this website. So. We want to go to the advanced plant search. That's where we're going to sort of work through a key like approach. What we're going to do is go down to our plant description and fill out as much information as we have. Now, of course, this is um, for Minnesotans, and so we don't have any location information that's going to be relevant, but we do have a lot of other stuff. So let's start working through this. Um, we have pink flowers. We have more than seven petals. Cluster shape uh, doesn't really apply. So we'll leave it uh, at any. Leaf attachment, alternate. We have simple leaves and uh, we look through here, toothless. Higher margins or toothless margins. So we're going to keep looking here. So here we can also choose, uh, we've observed it blooming in July. So that's going to help us too. So now that we've filled out basically this key approach, we will see how this does for us. Okay. So these are the results. So this is kind of like um, age number of, of newcombs. Um, so to kind of go through and try to work our way down to the species. So clearly we can kind of eliminate at least four of these. These flowers look nothing like what we have. So it's probably gonna be between these two echinacea species. So let's take, um, take a look at this one, narrow leaved purple cone flower. If this is the right one. Okay. so. What we're going to do, we're not going to go through all of these things, but first thing we're going to do is take a look at the notes. So, so some important things to note here. Um, what we learn is that uh, this is not typically found in the nursery trade, though native seed suppliers sometimes offer it. Okay, so that, especially if we're in a situation where we've done a native planting, that suggests this might not be, it could be, but Seems like it might not be. Um, see if we can learn more about this. So, um, talking about uh, how it could be a Western variety, not really relevant to our purposes. Um, talking through how it's related to Eastern Prairie Purple Cone Flower, but we've already taken care of that based on the um, results we have. It's probably not going to be. Eastern purple coneflower. So here's an interesting thing. So of these three native coneflowers, um, uh, the species is native to Minnesota, but the other two grow well here, but are com are commonly available in the native plant trade. Okay, so that that suggests that uh, what we're actually looking at would be uh, Echinacea pallida or pale purple coneflower. So let's take a look. So um, widely offered in the native plant trade. Um, this says it's similar to uh, the one we just looked at, but it has uh, ray petals or um, 
definitely, I think, matches our um, plant. So this is Justin, you're cutting out a little bit here. To this happened to me last time when I did this. Um, so this is our uh, pale purple gum flower, so Echinacea pallida. So um, other common names include pale cone flower. Um, this is a shorter plant for sure. It's uh, two to three feet tall. Um, and it's usually only um, going to be obvious to us uh, when it's flowering because it has mostly basal leaves um, and they're fairly in, uh, inconspicuous if they're not flowering. So again, this one is also not rhizomatous, but it is perennial. Um, is uh, getting towards the end of its uh, flowering season. So in Iowa, we're looking at June and July. So now is a good time to go take a look at this plant. Um, it's not going to be in bloom too terribly much longer. Okay. So um, here's a quick uh, look at how the um, this one is different than purple cone flower. Um, we uh, Minnesota wildflowers to kind of take things off the table, but um, Here's how you can tell them apart. But like we're saying, uh, pale purple cone flower has mostly basal leaves, whereas purple cone flower has mostly stem leaves. Um, the leaves are long and narrow with pale purple cone flower versus uh, egg shaped with purple cone flower. Um, the leaves are very quite hairy as well as rough in pale purple cone flower, whereas they're just rough with uh, purple cone flower. And, um, Pale purple cone flower flowers earlier and uh, purple cone flower flowers later. So they do overlap a little bit though. So again, mostly the leaves and how they're arranged on the stem, how long and narrow they are and how hairy they are can help you differentiate between uh, pale purple cone flower and just purple cone flower. Okay, so, um, so that's the end of my segments. Um, probably running a little bit, a couple minutes over here um, before I hand it over to Laura, but. There, um, there is a good question about uh, pale cone coneflower and it's, is it native or not? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So, so that question is, um, yeah, so it is technically native. Um, is it a characteristic plant of the tall grass prairie? No, that's, it's not. So, it's native in the sense that it's more of a savanna, kind of a shade of tolerant species, more um, typically going to be more um, found in the southeast part of Iowa, the very southeast tip, um, I believe is kind of where it's native to Iowa. So, so yes and no, um, it's still a, a good pollinator plant. It's very, again, it's, very similar functionally to pale purple cone flower. So it's um, so it's, uh, fulfilling a similar role as pale purple cone flower, but if you have, you know, it's it's good to have a um, one of the one of the two in your seed mix for sure. Pale purple cone flower would be sort of if you're trying to approximate something that was more akin to a, a historical tall grass prairie or a more sort of um, tall grass prairie uh, specific approach to how you develop a seed mix, you would uh, probably use pale purple cone flower, not prairie cone flower, but um, yeah. Excellent, I will try and unmute Dr. Jackson and I'll try and share her slides.
Laura, is it letting you unmute on your phone? Are you there, Laura? Dr. Jackson? There I'm trying to unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, uh, we will we will see how well this works. And um, hi, everybody. I'm Laura Jackson. I am calling from my phone, so I cannot see Andy's slides, but we think we're uh, Andy is going to forward the slides for me. And before each one, I'm going to make sure that I am talking about the one that you are looking at. So bear with us. Uh, I know location was very poor, basically non-existent internet service. So kind of unexpectedly, it was working yesterday. So I'm going to talk about five warm season grasses that are not blooming yet or maybe just starting to bloom. And we're going to try to go through what sort of things to look for to hide it, try to identify these when they are not flowering. Now, um, Andy, do you have the PowerPoint slide up on grass plants of the day without flowers? Yep, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so there's these are the five species. Don't be intimidated by all the Latin, um, but it's uh, little blue stem, side oats grandma, switchgrass, big blue stem, and Indian grass in order of appearance. So um, uh, basically, uh, you, can, you can forward to the next slide, Andy. Should say graph vegetative characters, and uh, there should be an image of the leaf blade, ligule, collar, and sheath. Yep. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, wonderful. So now we're going to just uh, keep forwarding down. Um, the big things you're going to be looking for are relative slides, so you can hit enter or get that cursor. The relative size of the plant. The next one is the leaf characters described in this slide. The next one is the tiller, and I'll explain what a tiller is. The shape of that tiller in cross section at the base of the tiller near the ground. So that's a big character we're gonna look at. The next one is hairs in specific places, and I should say specific types of hairs in specific places can help us with some species. And uh, so those are the main things. So the vocabulary uh, for the leaf characters, which we're still on the same slide, is um, the, the leaf blade, the ligule, the collar, and the sheath. So uh, a grass leaf consists of these two, these, these parts with uh, the action going on in that transition between the sheath, which is is uh, around the rest of the grass tiller or stem, and then uh, and then the blade, which has a different shape. And so that ligule is any kind of fringe. It could be a membrane. It could be hairs. It could be there could be nothing there at all um, that marks that transition from the sheath to the the blade. It's that first oval. And the second one is a collar, which is just the just what it sounds like. It looks like a like a, a collar on a collared shirt. Um, and sometimes there's some little processes, little thingies sticking out there on either side where that sheath comes together. And sometimes in, in some grasses, none that we'll cover today, that sheath is not split. You can see that in this case it looks like a bathrobe. It's it's split. You could open that up and there'd be two. Uh, two nice clear margins to that, but in some grasses that is actually um, that's actually fused. So it is a complete. You would have to rip that leaf tissue to open that sheath up. All right, um, I am going to forward uh, ask Andy to forward to the next slide, which should be a diagram of the grass leaf with a. Uh, the node, sheath, and blade labeled and a yellow line and the uh, measuring tape. Crossing my fingers, that's the case, Andy? Yep, yep, we're on the right page, yep. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, the leaf here uh, in a 
graph consists of everything that you see uh, running un underneath that yellow line, the, the sheath around whatever's coming next and the blade. And that base of that leaf, there is a node. Now this is, I'm showing two seed stalks of Canada wild rye, but in a non-reproductive grass uh, tiller, that node is clear at the base of the plant. You can barely see it, only if you really know what you're looking for. All right, I'm going to forward to the next slide. So I'm also going to use the word tiller. And a tiller or a shoot is a group of leaves that's all coming from the same growing point. Uh, they're all emanating from the same uh, magical little spot called a meristem where all these new cells are being produced and elongated. And so the first red oval show uh, that's vertical shows an individual tiller of quackgrass, agripyrin repens. And, and you can see that there are multiple tillers there uh, in, that, in that clump. And a lot of what we see in, in a grass clump is sort of the way those tillers relate to one another and their angles, the angle that they come out of the ground or, or come out from the underlying stems. Um, these, uh, these individual leaves are kind of telescoped in, so you, you, you don't see the whole leaf like you do on a, a lot of plants with a petiole and so forth. You see um, that the, the leaf blades, uh, the leaf sheaths are covering up tinier leaves that are inside. So that's what makes the grass look different and a little bit mysterious. But when you, once you understand it, it makes perfect sense. And then I've also circled the horizontal circle or oval rather shows what's underground in quack grass, which is some bodacious rhizomes. Rhizomes are stems. Um, they typically have roots coming out at the nodes rather than leaves, but they're growing underground in various directions to expand the size of the clone. And then at any time, they can pop up with new tillers. And so um, the brome and reed canary grass are in this category. It makes them extremely effective at expanding vegetatively. I use that word tiller quite a bit. Okay. Uh, let's head to the next slide. So one of the first things to notice about a grass that is vegetative, you don't have a seed stalk, you can't find an old seed stalk on it as a clue. Um, that's the first thing I look for and something that's vegetative is there, if it wasn't burned the, the previous spring, maybe there's an old seed stalk that I can look at that will give me, um, give me a hint. And you actually see that here in the Kentucky bluegrass on the far left. There's an old uh, seed head from earlier in the year. And that, if you know what that looks like, you can identify it that way. So that's sort of cheating, but that's, that's I'll, I'll cheat any, any way to identify this grass. So we think of grasses as all kind of looking alike, but they are different sizes. And so um, I've got it showing here, at least I hope that's what everybody's seeing, Andy, um, a lineup of six grasses. Kentucky bluegrass, little blue stem, side oats gram, Indian grass, switchgrass, and big blue stem by order of their size, their tiller size. And so it's essentially the leaf shape, the length to width ratio, and the absolute maximum diameter of, of the tiller, of the leaf width, let's say, with um, little blue stem being significantly bigger than Kentucky bluegrass, really, um, and side oats gramma being a touch bigger than little blue stem with a different leaf angle, a different angle to how the leaves come out of the, out of the sheet. And then Indian grass, switchgrass, and big blue stem being in a whole nother class, much, much bigger um, stem. So that's something to look at. And you really can see it in the field. If you look, uh, can you forward to the next slide, please? If you are, are out in a, in our case, this is a near monoculture of little blue stem uh, that we use for seed production. Um, but uh, some some Indian grass has crept in and invaded the little blue stem, and it's readily evident. You can see that big, broad leaf on the right. It's circled and hatched uh, red circles. That big, broad leaf clearly that's a different grass than the little blue stem to the left. So 
use use your senses. You, you can almost think of it as the texture of the grass. The texture looks different in the field. And that might be the way to sort of initially spot, hey, that's something different. Let's go take a closer look. All right, next slide should be, uh, say, number two, leaf collar with oracles and ligule. Yep. More of a close-up of yep, this. Um, is that it? Yep, yep, we're on the right side. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so this is just another diagram with the same stuff. Um, I think you got it the first time, but this sort of blows it up a little bit more, showing those ligules, um, oracles, and the collar and the sheath for this particular graph, which is gonna look different. All right, now here's one you may not have thought of, and that is the shape of the tiller um, or the shoot in cross section at the base of the plant. So these are three species. The first one is completely round. The second one is kind of oval. If you feel it in your fingers, it uh, also might be called two-sided or flattened. And then the third one is so skinny that I can't even, I couldn't even cut it and prop it up so it was upright. So you're not seeing the cross section, you're just seeing little sections. Um, imagine cutting celery up, you know, into very, very fine divisions. Well, if it gets too fine, you know, that's not going to, it's not going to stay up for you. So um, these are, are things that you feel with your fingers at the base of the plant. Uh, so that is something that we'll get to when I show you this little key I made up for those five grasses. So remember that. All right, next slide. Uh, number four, hairs in particular places. Is that what we got? Yep, that's it. Okay, so, all right. So this is a uh, called a papillose hair. It's a hair with a little pimple at its base. Sometimes they're also called glandular hairs. Um, it has a bump there at the base. Not all hairs do. And uh, other things that you'll notice, this is on the leaf margin, which is the very edge of the leaf. It's sticking out perpendicular to the edge of the leaf and in, really in the same plane as the leaf blade. And um, that is characteristic of Cytos gramma. Only Cytos gramma looks like that. Um, and also those uh, glandular hairs tend to look sort of evenly spaced. And there's a lot of hairs on a lot of especially warm season grasses. There's all kinds of hairs in all kinds of places. So just saying something is hairy, noticing something is hairy is not going to help you. And to make matters worse, some species of grass are variably hairy. So you'll have big blue stem that's hairier and fuzzier than other varieties or even individuals in the same stand. So I don't want you to think that if you find some hairs, you're, you're home free. That's not the case. It's particular types of hairs in particular places. Uh, next slide is the beginning of this vegetative key for five warm season grasses. And uh, is that what you've got, Andy? Yep, that's it. All right. So I'm fading out the stuff that I don't want you to look at, but that's the direction we're going. It's a dichotomous key. There's two choices. And uh, basically, I'm just using little, little plant tricks that you can memorize about these different species to guide you to the right answer. But that's only if one of the plants that you're looking at is one of those five. If you're out in a remnant prairie where there's a lot of diversity of grasses, uh, or even a really nice uh, and sophisticated uh, CRP planting or roadside planting, there could be some other grasses there. Um, so first of all, check to make sure that it's not flowering right now. If it's a warm season grass, I mean, it's a cool season grass, it is flowering or has flowered this spring already. And so those seed heads will be there. Uh, now, um, I've seen some side oats grandma is, is blooming in the south side of my house. So that's getting going. And um, I've also seen a lot of switchgrass that's in boot, the, the seed head is in there, in the in the, the comb, but it hasn't emerged yet. So uh, some of these some of these warm season grasses are are getting started. But make sure it's a warm season grass, not something that's already flowered. And feel the base of the of the tiller, the base of the stem, right next to the ground. And if it is completely flat 
like a like a rejection envelope from something that you've applied for. You applied for college, your kid has applied for college, they get that envelope and it's a skinny envelope. That's not that's that's bad news, right? So that skinny envelope feel is what a little blue stem tiller feels like. There's nothing much in there. It's really flat. Um, if it's if it's really flat, it's a little blue stem. It's a carium scoparium. If the tillers aren't flat, then it's something else. So we move on to the next thing. All right, let's do another. Uh, let's do the next slide. Uh, might have to scroll through a little bit there. Envelope flat. It's a little blue stem. It's also relatively small compared to these other things. So it's the littlest of everything that we're looking at today. All right, next slide is a uh, vegetative key for five co common warm season grasses. And we're moving on to stems are not flat. Then what do we have to look at instead? Well, uh, the first, th the question is, do they have pairs with a bulge at the base and the blade margins? Does that sound familiar? Uh, Papalos hairs and the blade margins. If it does, it is Budalua crotopendula or Cytos gramma. Um, if it is not, then we have to look at some other things. So uh, if there's no um, bulges at the base of leaves on the blade margins, let's uh, figure out what happens next. Um, let's see, and I think I have another image here. Um, just a little bit of a warning. You need to handle these leaves carefully. Hairs can rub off quite easily, especially these. And so if you pick a very an older leaf or if you manhandle that leaf a little too much, those hairs will snap off and you won't see them. So handle it carefully and find a newer, younger leaf where those, those characteristics. This is the kind of thing, if your eyes are good, you may be able to see it. You should be able to see it without a hand lens. Um, these were taken with a close-up uh, lens on the camera. So this is the kind of thing where it's good to have that hand lens with you because you may be unsure, or it may be a little fuzzy, but if you get uh, that hand lens out, you'll see it no problem. Uh, there's another image showing some of those hairs kind of broken off. Okay, now, um, if it is, um, if there's no papillose hairs, we've ruled out little blue stem and cytos gramma so far. Then um, we look for at the base of the leaf blade, the base of the leaf blade adjacent to that ligule, but above it. Um, there, if there is a patch of dense hairs, then it's probably switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. And so let's look at that picture. Here's that patch of dense hairs, very, uh, very fuzzy. And uh, sometimes people call it the hairy armpit. <laughs> if you see that hairy armpit, then uh, that is probably switchgrass. But also check the size of the plant. It should be the right size. It shouldn't be tiny, and it shouldn't be flowering uh, right now. Um, okay, so that's a nice nifty character. It also the ligule is also hairy, so you notice it's 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 not a membrane; it's just a fringe of hairs. Um, that's that's another good characteristic. All right, I'm going to uh, move on to the next slide. Hopefully, we're back to the key. Andy, is everything nope, in sync? We're back here? to the key on the last okay. uh, points. Okay, so. If there's no patch of dense hairs, we've we've eliminated the, the three easy ones. So now we're just looking at big blue stem versus Indian grass. And that one can be harder than you think, even though they're quite distinctive. They're also kind of variable. So um, the best character by for, for me when I'm trying to tell big blue stem from Indian grass, because they're about the same size, they have about the same phenology, um, and they're going to take their sweet time to bloom. They're not going to start until, you know, late July or into August before they bloom. So there's a long time during the year when they're vegetative and you're wondering what they are. 
Uh, and that is the, the cross section of the tiller at the, at the base of the plant. And big blue stem is oval in cross section and uh, Indian grass is clearly round in cross section, no hint of being oval or flattened at all. There's a couple of other features we'll look at too, but there's that Indian grass cross section. It also, in addition to that, that round cross section has a woody collar and ligule. It's very tough. Don't look at young seedlings. Don't look at young leaves. Look at, at a mature leaf. And it's quite tough and even woody. And the, the oracle or, uh, or collar is sometimes uh, people say it looks like a gun sight. Like you could sight down that V um, that you're looking at there on the right and, and, sh and uh, to help you aim uh, to aim. So people will talk about the aiming or the gun sight. They'll also talk about that uh, having a, having ears or oracles there. Um, and, and those are good, but those can be a little bit vague with younger leaves. And so I really like checking for the cross section on the, on, on the stem first and then confirming it with these other things. So let's compare that to big blue stem in the next slide. Um, it is oval, definitely oval in cross section, consistently oval. And um, you just feel that with your fingers. It does not have a collar or arcle. It doesn't have those ears sticking up. If you look there on the left, there's, there's a lot of hairs, but there's no pointy thing there on as the leaf meets the, the blade meets the sheath. And the ligule is um, easy to see, and it's, it's a membrane. Um, the, 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 I'm going to go back a slide just quickly to, comp well, no, I actually have a slide next, next slide. Let's look at the next slide. So this is a good comparison. Um, I'm not showing the ligules of both, but the, the ligule of the Indian grass on the right is not as, it, it's much firmer and heavier than the one on the big blue stem. It's a little hard to tell because sometimes these things also break off or are damaged. And so you can find yourself looking for a ligule that's, that's no longer there. So that's the contrast. Um, I will uh, finish up here with a, uh, if, if you're interested in learning your grasses for Iowa upper Midwest for open grown grasses, we don't cover the, the woodland or savanna part shade species, but um, Botany Beginners Grasses for the Masses is archived. We did that last summer. There are, I believe, seven lectures, um, some in for the cool season grasses and some for the warm season. And uh, if you, uh, you can access those, um, those videos on our YouTube channel and on our website. And it will march you through the various grasses that are blooming at about the time that a lecture was originally given. So it's easier to go out and, you know, go out your back door, go out into the field, and you'll see a lot of those grasses that we talk about in the lecture. So uh, that's, uh, that's one way to do it. And uh, hopefully you will be successful. So. With that, I will turn it back over to Justin and Andy Olson. Thanks. Or ask for any questions. Yeah, any questions, be happy to try to answer them. Uh, one question, can we get a printable version of your grass key? Yes, uh, you can. In fact, I think we already have that on our website under course resources. I will double check that. But I think um, we, do. we have a, don't we? Yeah. I believe so, yeah. Um, I don't think there's any other questions. I'll just cycle through your last slides one more time shortly because I went through them a little janky. So sorry about that, everybody. We'll get the slides put up. Let me stop sharing. Any other questions? I don't think so. Um, we're a little over, so I think we're going to go ahead and end it. Um, thanks, Laura, for joining us via the phone. I think it worked okay. I hope I didn't mess up your slides too bad. Thank you, um, Andy. 
Yeah. All right. Um, and thanks to Justin and thanks to Anne as well. She she helps a lot. So not to leave her unincluded. So thank you to everybody for showing up. We'll see you next week. Bye.